Hi, everyone. I am Elizabeth Klein. I am a journalist and I am the author of two books, The Conscious Closet and Overdressed. And I am so excited to be presenting this event to mark Earth Day 2021. So this event is part of Selfridge's Project Earth initiative, which is a journey the store is embarked on, uh, both to put sustainability at the heart of its business and that aims to change the way we shop by 2025, which is of course just around the corner. Um, and this conversation is co-hosted co by Intelligence Squared, which is the world's leading forum for live debate and discussion. So our, our conversation today is called As Good As New, um, Can Resale and Repair Create a Brighter Future for Fashion? And this is a subject I'm really passionate about, so I'm excited to have it with our three esteemed panelists today. So really what we're going to be focusing on is discussing how, kind of given how overwhelming sustainability can feel and fashion and sustain sustainability can feel, like how can we really shift consumers towards more sustainable wardrobes? And what is it really take to shift mindsets and actions when it comes to the clothes in our closet. And we have uh, three brilliant voices in sustainability with us to discuss these topics, and I am going to introduce them uh, uh, before we get going. So first we have Shawnee Brett. So Shawnee is a director of Sust Consulting. She uh, works with brands to encourage sustainable consumption. I believe I have that right. Um, Shawnee's worked with Nike, Office Shoes, the BBC, among other companies. Um, she's also a consultant for Project 2030, worked in the fashion industry, industry for 12 years. And if I have this right, I believe in 2019, challenged herself to not shop for an entire year. And I am sure she'll mention um, how that experience changed her perspective. So welcome, Shawnee. Uh, next up, we have Aisha Tan Jones. Aisha is a very multifaceted person. Uh, they, they are a model, artist, herbal activist, founder of the community apothecary, Fertile Soils. Um, Aisha's art has been showcased and performed in Yorkshire Sculpture Park, the Serpentine Gallery, among other prestigious spaces. And you may have heard of Aisha because in 2019, uh, they staged a silent protest on the Gucci catwalk um, against the label's exploitation of mental health in its fashion show. And last but not least, um, I just wanted to say one more thing about Aisha, also a musician, and through a project known as Yaya Bones, uh, creates safe spaces for queer folk to meditate, practice yoga, and self-defense. Self so I'm super curious, given um, you know many pots that you have your hands in, Aisha, um, how, how you really think about sustainability. Last but not least, we have Lauren Bravo with us here today. Lauren is the author of How to Break Up with Fast Fashion, A Guilt-Free Guide to Changing the Way You Shop for Good. And I believe that that was also inspired by your own year-long fast fashion ban. Um, Lauren, yeah, Lauren's writing has appeared in Vogue, The Telegraph, The Guardian, among other publications. She writes about fashion, feminism, lifestyle, and most recently she has contributed to an intersectional feminist essay collection called uh, This is How We Come Back Stronger, Feminist Writers on Turning Crisis into Change. So thank you so much to all, all three of you for being here with us. So just one little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We are going to have a, um, we're going to be taking questions from the audience um, and answering those questions towards the end of the conversation. So if you have a question for our panelists, just go ahead and um, pop it into the box on your, on your screen and we'll be collecting those questions and we'll um, have the panelists an answer them for you towards the end of the conversation. Okay, so on that note, let's let's get into it. Um, you know, I I think a good place to start is just hearing from the three of you about how you got interested in this subject to begin with. You know, sustainability and sustainability in fashion um, is still something that a lot of people are just now kind of coming around to. So I'm wondering for each of you, you know, is it something that you gradually got into or did you have some sort of um an aha moment uh so shawnee let's start let's start with you and then we'll hear from asia and lauren 
Sure. I 100% had an aha moment um, because having spent 10 years as a personal stylist, I became really good at convincing people to buy clothes, including myself. And so I was fully addicted to buying clothes and could always find some sort of rationale for, ne for thinking I, could, I need something. Uh, because I was so addicted um, and it was really affecting my mental health, it was something that I was just thinking about all the time, constant shopping list in my head. Um, I woke up one day with an idea, which was no shopping for a year. Could I do it? And even the idea, even the question, could I do it, made me think, oh, well, I better try it because I should be able to do it. Um, and through that year of no shopping, uh, my mindset completely changed and I changed my job and everything changed. And, and so, yes, that was my epiphany. <laughs> Lauren, so I'm curious if, if you know, the, the shopping ban was what kicked things off for you or if you came, you came to sustainable fashion from a different uh, starting point. It's a bit of both, really. So I have, in some ways, very similar journey to Shawnee um, in that I was, throughout my 20s, I was a proper fast fashion addict, I suppose. You know, I was constantly thinking about shopping. I was perpetually scrolling on my phone for the latest bargain. I was always standing in the post office queue with my arms full of returns. Um, and I kind of realised, I guess, that shopping really wasn't making me happy um, on a selfish level. I realised that it was not ever delivering, to be honest, what it promised. And at the same time, as a fashion writer, I was um, unavoidably starting to read a lot more about the environmental impact of the industry and, of course, the humanitarian cost of all those cheap clothes. Um, I think I watched The True Cost maybe four years ago, and that was a massive wake up call as it is for everybody who watches it. Um, but the interesting thing as well is that I grew up wearing mostly secondhand. My parents are very into charity shops. You know, we always, we wore hand-me-downs, we wore thrift store clothes. In my teens, I was very into vintage. So it was something that, you know, I, I'd been there before and we didn't call it sustainability back then. It was just either necessity or it was cool, you know, or vintage because I thought it made me a bit alternative and trendy in my teens. And so I'd really fallen out of that habit. So in some ways I've almost kind of come full circle and actually had to relearn the things that I was doing more naturally when I was younger. And Aisha, for you, where, where did this journey start? Um, similar to Lauren, I think uh, in my teens, I was always wearing secondhand clothes, vintage clothes. I worked, my first job was at a vintage shop in my small hometown. And um, even to this day, most of my wardrobe is hand-me-downs from both of my parents. Um, and yeah, so it kind of has always been there. And like Lauren said, it was never called sustainability. Um, but I have been guilty of those moments where you're just like obsessively like checking, uh, like especially right now, like online shopping and um, that kind of addiction to buying new things. But I've never really had that, um, like, I've never been like overly obsessed with um, with kind of shopping in retail spaces and I think that's actually because like the space it just um, going to a shop kind of like within a lot of shops don't have natural light I kind of feel kind of like um, a bit enclosed in there um, and there's something about going charity shop shopping where you can like feel the story on the clothes and I love just like finding that bargain or finding like the gem hidden in the racks so I've always been addicted to that I guess more than the fast fashion. So for me, it's been more gradual, which has always kind of been there. Um, but I'm becoming, I mean, the conversation around it is getting so much more spoken about that. Um, I know I have to em implement it even more, not just into my fashion, my clothes, but like all of my um, shopping habits as well now. Yeah, and I really, I would love to hear um, from all of you as well, a little bit more about the work that you do, because you're sort of, um, you know, Lauren, you're coming at this from the space of journalism and Asia through, you know, music and art and Shawnee, you're, you're working more in the consulting space. So I, I want to hear more about your particular approach to sustainability. So Shawnee, I, I want to start with you just because I think like consumer research is so interesting. Like, have you discovered why why we all buy so much and why we're so addicted and why why do we keep doing this? <laughs> yeah, so um, my background, I sort of trained in psychology and then was lured into, into fashion when I graduated. Uh, and so my sort of full circle moment was bringing back that psychology element and starting to use that, um, that sort of um, that research uh, to 
try and bring new insights into the, the conversation. And uh, what I've noticed is that most of the data that we're working with un to understand consumers um, are survey stats that I just, I'm just very skeptical of. And so when we hear that 73% of consumers would spend more for a more sustainable item, I just don't think that's true. <laughs> I think that everybody greenwashes, um, including us, and that's, you know, a very well known thing that, that our values do say one thing, but our actions say another. So I've been doing a lot of research um, with Project 2030 to try and identify, try and really understand the narratives and, and rationale that's going on inside um, inside people's heads as they shop. Um, and the way that I do that is I actually just do a Zoom call uh, with a shopper and they share their screen and I just watch and ask them questions and try and understand the kind of um, the meaning and the value that they're placing in certain areas and the way that they're making certain decisions. Um, and unfortunately, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned through that process is that in that decision making moment, when you're deciding whether to add something to your cart or not, um, there are three very, very strong decision making criteria. One is cost, one is function and one is style. And they're so strong. And when we have our consumer hat on, we feel so comfortable with that lovely, easy journey that we've always done. Um, and so it's very hard to start pushing a new criteria into that habit. Um, it's something that I, th I think there are opportunities for change, but I'm not sure if it's at the cart because I think in that moment we're just full, cons we are sort of full consumer identity. Yeah, that's so interesting. So it's like there's already three things that people are looking at when they're shopping, and, and our our movement is essentially asking to add another layer of considerations into that that decision. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um, uh, also that the, that it's sort of at a different scope, because when you're thinking about cost, function and style, they're all things that are good for me as a as a shopper. And then you're asking to add sustainability, which is like something that's good for the world around you. So you're also having to sort of change focus, like taking on and off your glasses, which is an exhausting thing to yeah. do. That's such a good way to put that shift in mind mindset. And Aisha, I think that that's a, a good segue into your work. So how 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 do you connect art and music um, and, and some of your other practice back to sustainability and back to sustainability in fashion? Hmm. So I had, um, like we were talking about aha moments earlier. My aha moment was um, actually in art making. Um, and just before I graduated I was um I studied sculpture and I was making a lot of work with materials that just weren't sustainable but they were really cool and they were really fun to work with but these materials were toxic and the sculpture I was making I was still a student so it's not going to be like an amazing sculpture that's going to sell for loads of money so I'm just making this kind of average sculpture that won't biodegrade and just kind of exists and um that's when I was like wait I can't do this anymore I can't keep making work with materials that just are going to be on this planet forever and, and actually could leach out and hurt and harm the planet so I really like made a conscious decision that I will only make work with um, products and materials that are good for the earth um, or that are literally made of the earth so like clay wood and um, now I work with mushrooms um, a lot and um, all these things make uh, are like fit with like my morals in alignment with um, what I'm outputting into the planet. So when it comes to like fashion, which is something you're um, often you like have an exchange that so you buy from someone else. Um, it, it makes me think that I like using my craft and using my skills. How can I like buy clothes that are, you know, they're better for the planet either by the materials that they, they are. So like this jumper is made from recycled um, plastics, recycled ocean plastics. Um, or you could buy, you know, wool jumpers or materials like flax, um, which is linen. So these, when they break down, they're not gonna leach microplastics into the washing and stuff like that and go into the water system. So this all became so like, I became so much more aware of this. And um, obviously as an artist and as a creative, um, it's just so much fun to just like edit your clothes and just customize and I've been doing that since I was a child and I used to get told off by my mum for like customizing my clothes um because she thought I was ruining it but actually um I made them look cooler so I'm definitely back into that these days just really like 
yeah having a lot of fun in the studio and just creating something you want to create because also it's way better to have something that's unique to you um not something that so many people are going to buy on the rack and so lauren for you you know when you're communicating about this like you know we're both journalists and writers like what have what have you learned about you know those those people who maybe are a bit more reticent or who haven't made that jump onto the other side to really thinking about sustainability and fashion like what have you learned about the the way to talk about this as a journalist and writer and, and bring people into the fold mm, yeah i mean that's such a good question i think that you know when i had my sort of wake up moment and realized that i was complicit in the industry you know i was one of those journalists writing those articles saying you know here are 13 skirts you need this season or uh you know my most shameful one i think was i once wrote an article on why it made sense to buy something while you still found it ugly because that was how indoctrinated i was into the fashion system the idea that I ought to be investing in trends knowing that in three months time i might like it because then in another four months time it'll be over so in terms of speaking to other people i think i remember you know just how i felt when i was in that headspace feeling like i was on that perpetual treadmill of trends you know running to a horizon that you never kind of get to because there's always another bag another shoe another jacket that you need and actually writing my book from very much within the process of moving away from fast fashion. I, I, when I first got approached to write the book, I felt like um, I wasn't qualified. You know, I said, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning this stuff. I'm, I'm not there yet. And then actually thought about it some more and realized that perhaps there was quite a lot of value in people being able to read a very honest account from somebody who is not in any way an eco saint. You know, I have a section at the beginning of the book called Notes on Being Terrible, which is very much my confessional, where I say, look, I'm, I'm, you know, a very lapsed vegan, I'm not perfect at recycling, I still fly sometimes, you know, I'm very much sort of still working through this. And I think that that kind of honesty is a good way to get through to people. I also think um, bringing a lot of joy to it. So really acknowledging that, you know, clothes can be such a powerful force for good. And they always have been for millennia, people have celebrated adorning their bodies they've used clothes as a way of expressing who they are of you know forging kind of connections with other people and all of that can be positive and i think that there tends to be a bit of a misconception that sustainable fashion has to mean resigning yourself to life in a sort of utilitarian beige boiler suit and some people look brilliant in that but you know it, it's really much not my personal style and i think it isn't a lot of other people as well so that's what i always try and do is communicate that actually you know, there are ways of dressing sustainably that still feel like yourself, you know, still feel celebratory, can be a bit maximalist, can be flamboyant, um, and that there is room in, in the movement for everybody, whatever their style, whatever their budget, whatever their background. Yeah, so so now that we've hopefully convinced the audience that this can be a, a joyous and a celebratory kind of transition to make, I think maybe let's like get into the into the weeds just a little bit and talk about why um, sustainability and fashion is necessary in the first place. Like, why are we having this conversation? And Aisha, I thought it would be good to start with you because of your experience modeling. I was wondering if you could share, um, you know, what you've seen about just sustainability in, in runway shows, for example, and then um, Lauren and Shawnee, I'd love to hear if there are particular aspects of the fashion industry that you feel are particularly unsustainable or that we need to be focusing on. So like I've been modeling since um, I was 14, which is a really long time. I'm 27 now. Um, and so in that time, um, been on a lot of photo shoots, I've been on a, lot, on a lot of sets and I've done quite a few runways. Um, and I would say that um, people think about fashion as just the output, like just the clothes that you buy, but everything that goes behind that, every um, photo shoot, every runway has a huge impact of uh, waste and um, of like a huge, a huge carbon footprint. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you can hear the music, there's lots of cyclists going past. Um, but yeah, I noticed it like mainly like when uh, it's mainly like the catering department on sets, you'll have, um, you know, a whole table full of plastic bottles um, because obviously you need to stay hydrated on set, but that's a lot of plastic that's going to waste. Um, or you'll have plastic cups, um, obviously all the cutlery and then whether the food is actually even sustainable. And then obviously the, the kind of, 
um, flights, say you're doing a show in a different country, flying how many models, like maybe 100, 200 models out just for one show is a huge carbon footprint. And a lot of um, these brands do say that they offset it, but there's also a lot of problem with carbon offsetting as well. It's not always like the best um, option or like, um, it's not just, it's not a cure, it's not an answer to that amount of people flying on an airplane. But I would say that over the years, um, there has been a, a little bit of change. So I've done a shoot, um, maybe it was a couple of years ago now, but it was for a shoe that was also using um, ocean plastic. So it was reusing so that it, it would be ironic if then on set, everything was plastic, but the producers were amazing. Everyone got their own water bottle, a reusable water bottle that they had to use for the whole four days of the shoot. And like um, the food was all vegan and, um, there was just that little bit of extra effort from the producers to make it a more sustainable shoot. Obviously it wasn't perfect, but um, I think there are, if the production teams are aware and want that to be, um, want to strive for sustainability, it will happen. But it is cheaper to not, it's cheaper to just bulk buy a bunch of water bottles, put them on the table and be like, we fed the models water, you know? Um, so there's still a lot of work to do, but it is, positive to see that change happen. And Lauren, what about you? Um, you know, what has your research shown about the supply chain side of things or the manufacturing, the making of clothes? Like what worries you when it comes to fashion and sustainability? And are you seeing this, um, any similar sort of positive shifts in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the supply chain, one of the things that became quite apparent quite quickly when I sort of started researching was people are very keen to separate out people and planet. And that's something that I would get very frustrated by because actually as soon as you look at it, you know, for any amount of time, you realize that everywhere that climate change is having an impact, it is affecting people. And brands all too often are, you know, very quick to sort of wave around their sustainability credentials, talking about recycling, about material technologies, things like that, while still completely sidestepping any questions about garment worker rights, about paying people living wages. Um, you know, we've seen the last year over the pandemic, we've seen terrible things happening in countries like Bangladesh, where billions of dollars worth of orders have been cancelled and brands are refusing to pay for them. And there's a real double standard. Yeah. And I think there's so much greenwashing in the industry that, um, you know, I find massively frustrating. So certainly transparency is one of the things I like to focus on getting people kind of, um, I guess, equipped to interrogate brands more thoroughly to really ask the questions and not be fooled by wafty language. Uh, everything can be conscious and responsible, but if it hasn't got any kind of hard fact or stat to back it up, then we don't necessarily need to trust it. Um, and yeah, I think really just making sure that wherever we're having those conversations around sustainability, we are always remembering to center people in those, you know, whether it's communities who, um, whose environments are being destroyed to kind of intensively farm fabrics, whether it's garment workers living on poverty wages in, you know, working in horribly unsafe conditions. Um, and also thinking about the relentless pace and volume and overconsumption, because, you know, it's, we talk a lot about, um, yeah, about the sort of, future of recycling and things which I think is really exciting and definitely something to kind of feel positive about but that won't make a difference unless we also massively scale back productions so it's trying to balance those things but yeah I think there are definitely a lot of really positive things happening as well and actually seeing individual consumers waking up to the reality of the stories behind their clothes I think is really encouraging you know certainly just in the last kind of couple of years since I wrote the book those conversations have been happening in spaces that were not before you know i've seen mainstream media publications have been so much more open to talking about it i've you know done magazine shoots where i've been allowed to wear top to toe second hand clothes which i don't think would have happened a couple of years ago um so those shifts definitely are happening but i think it's just keeping the sort of small accessible changes that everyday people can do in line with you know grand activism and massive systemic change which we also need to happen and sort of doing both in tandem i think is the challenge and so, um, Shawnee, for you, yeah, you know, my understanding is that part of your research is is about shifting consumer behavior. So when I, you know, when I ask what concerns you about fashion and sustainability, I'm super curious. Like, is it is it the overconsumption piece of it, and what have you learned about shifting us away from that? 
Yeah, it's interesting because it's a huge, it's a massive extension from um, from what Lauren was just saying. Um, but when we think about sustainability, um, it, it, the sort of general feeling, the, the general kind of image we get is this extractive system where we, we're extracting resources, we're extracting labour, and we're not renewing from the places that we're taking. Um, and what that does is it sort of puts us in a position of responsibility where we as humans almost are like the guardians of nature and i would like to sort of challenge that idea that we are the guardians of nature and instead um suggest that we are nature too and so we're part of sustainability so for us as consumers what are we extracting or what's what is the system extracting from us maybe our money maybe our um, ability to sustain long-term happiness like what what are the things that are being the resources within ourselves that are being extracted um, and i think that that's quite an interesting mindset to think about then when we're making our own decisions as consumers because it makes it easier for us to self-sustain and to imagine ourselves as a planet that needs sustaining and replenishing and then perhaps if we're feeling a little bit um, of a deficit of happiness or of something that we will replenish it in a slightly more healthy way than buying something that makes us happy for um, a day or a week so I, I do want to focus a little bit, um, or a lot, if you if you want to dig into it, um, resale and repair. You know, that's that's the theme of this conversation, and I've been so surprised and delighted over the past few years to just see um, secondhand to just really take. You know, it's just really taken off, and it's been embraced. There are, are more options for shopping secondhand. Um, than ever before, but then we're also seeing people returning to mending and caring for their clothes, which is really exciting. So Aisha, I thought we'd start again with you. Like you said that, um, you know, uh, I believe that you you did a lot of your own customization. I'm wondering for you, why you think this is taking off repair repair and buying secondhand and, and does it really, how important is it to sustainability and fashion? I think it's really important to uh, for all consumers to actually like divest from being a consumer and being a creator, and um, that just it for me it would make uh, us as a as a people like way more in control of like our um, what we're putting on our bodies and um, really highlight how amazing and talented and creative like all people are, and I feel like. Um, maybe it's something to do with the education system where a lot of people were told that they're not creative enough to you know pursue creative activities as a career but like mending and any that's a form of craft and it's a traditional um like way of thinking and a knowledge that has been lost um like weaving knitting and knitting is still about like people love to knit and it is i've seen like this amazing uprising of like young people knitting and i love to see that um but there are so many like traditional ways of um cr of crafting that aren't like art in in our like 21st century view of art but they're like crafts and it's so um for me like i want to learn all these things because i want to be able to like darn my socks and like um it just is also a way of survival and uh, these are like survival skills that we all should know um so it's sort of the things that i reckon we should learn at school it would be amazing if um you know we had that in our classes um and maybe some schools do i can't remember if i did i remember at school um uh on the sewing machine, learning how to use the sewing machine and I kind of like ran over my finger at the sewing machine. So I think I blocked out all of that. But yeah, it's taking back power, yeah. I think. That's really beautiful. And yeah, I do remember learning how to sew maybe in seventh grade. And then I think the class after me, it was just eliminated and has in, been lost in a lot of ways. So it's it's cool to see a younger generation really try to bring it back. So so Lauren, what for you? Um, are you a big secondhand shopper? Do you do you mend? Do you repair? What's your relationship to this particular subject? Um, yes to all of those. Yes, yes, yes. I yeah, predominantly buy secondhand now. Um, but I think what's really interesting, particularly this time around, as opposed to when I was 17, 18, is that the secondhand market and what we include in that bracket has expanded hugely. So, you know, it doesn't just mean going to a charity shop or going to a thrift store. It certainly doesn't mean that you have to look retro, you know, although I, I like that. But um, actually, we now have such a booming resale market 
I guess as a reflection of the fact that the industry moves so quickly, it means that there are now, sadly, so many garments out there that have barely been worn at all. Um, but the positive in that is that I think people are really kind of destigmatizing the idea of wearing something previously owned by somebody else. It means that um, I think we're less hung up on the idea of newness and people are now more prepared to buy something pre-owned, to pass it on. Um, you know, obviously the, the rise of rental as well, which I know Selfridges has been supporting, that seems to be going hand in hand with resale. So a lot of the time, I think people are maybe investing in an item of clothing that is perhaps more expensive than something that, you know, they would have bought in the past, but they're doing it thinking that they will rent it out potentially or sell it on to the next person. Um, so I think all of that is really positive. Um, and in terms of mending, yeah, so I, I did learn to sew at school, actually, I was quite lucky, I did a GCSE in textiles, um, made entirely in practical dress out of big chiffon petals. Um, but, 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 you know, when in my 20s, when I was into fast fashion, I really let that habit slide. And I think we have to recognise as well that, you know, the industry, um, the fast fashion industry is not set up to encourage us to look after our clothes because of course they want to keep us shopping. And so things like seam allowance, I was chatting to a designer the other day who was saying that um, she's really excited about her new collection. She's purposely making it with a lot of seam allowance so that if people's bodies change over time, they can alter the dresses or take them to a tailor and have them altered. Um, and that way they're investing in something that they can potentially wear for years and years. Whereas, you know, and of course, if you buy vintage, that's one of the wonderful things you often find is that things used to have a lot more seam allowance or, you know, big hems where you could take them up or down as fashion changed. And that's something we've kind of lost. So I really hope that we're also going to see a return to that kind of conscious design where the ability to repair and mend is actually sort of designed in to a garment from the beginning as well. Um, yeah, there's so much more to say, but I'll let yeah. you carry on. <laughs> Yeah, Shawnee, so so what is your what's your relationship? Are you a big repairer? Do you buy a lot of secondhand? And and what kinds of consumer trends are you seeing in this area? Like I'm curious to know what, what you think about why. I mean, why secondhand? I would say just as recently as five years ago, it wasn't something um, that was very mainstream, and we've just seen this really big shift in consciousness in this area. Yeah, I think that originally, or at least maybe sort of five, ten years ago, um, it was very much and the idea of vintage shopping was um, having a good eye and being able to find one-off little gems here and there, rather than this is the default, unless you're buying underwear and then you can buy new, you know? So actually, um, I think that's where it's shifting. And, and luckily there's a sort of social norm shift happening where it's becoming a little bit more um, accepted as a default, which is brilliant. Um, my own personal journey with it is basically that. So I used to do a little bit of vintage shopping and find bits and pieces. And then when I did my year of no shopping, I found that it was those vintage finds that I was wearing the most, that I was loving the most and getting the most joy from, and that any sort of fast fashion-y bits just sort of stopped bringing me any happiness or they stopped being wearable. And so, um, and then in terms of kind of repair, it was the same. I started during that year, started going and taking things to, um, to the restorer. I took a pair of shoes to the restorer and I took a leather jacket to a leather repairer. And then these stories start building, these items, these garments start developing their own stories. Um, and bit by bit, the concept of value changed where it, value no longer felt like it was related to kind of newness or status, but instead value felt much more connected to kind of longevity or, or stories and meaning in the clothes. And I think um, that actually represents a kind of bigger cultural shift that's happening where value is being redefined, um, which is really exciting, I think. So I think that one of the biggest barriers to people um, certainly repairing their clothes and even to a certain extent, a certain extent embracing secondhand is there's this perception that it's maybe more difficult. Um, it's not as easy as just grabbing something off the rack or pressing, you know, buy now on Amazon or what have you. Um, how do we help get people over these barriers and to what degree has technology and social media helped make it easier for people to make these changes. Um, and uh, Shawnee, I'll start again with you there. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, when I've spoken to people who are more mainstream shoppers, um, they would probably be a little bit terrified of the idea of shopping on eBay because um, there's a lot of 
filtering that you need to be able to do um, to get to the um, the stuff that that works for you. Um, so you sort of have to be a professional shopper to be able to really master eBay. I'm not one of those people. I admire. I'm sure Lauren, you are. I'm, I really admire people that can, can handle it. <laughs> Yeah, um, but uh, um, I, but I, I guess with technology, um, algorithms are going to be helping. You know, if if there are such places such as Depop where there are algorithms that actually really understand um, consumers and are able to bring the right things to the right people, um, then it's starting to make it a lot easier for people. Um, and certainly, when I speak to younger shoppers, people in their teens, um, they tend to find Depop to be the first place that they would go to shop, which is super exciting. Um, I think there's always still the element of newness that um, and of sort of speed of consumption that isn't solved through that. Um, but that's possibly a, a different question and a different conversation. Yeah, it's almost like a good thing that it's adding in some speed bumps, right? So it's like adding just a little bit of friction, like you don't want to turn people off from buying secondhand, but it's good that people have to stop and think a little bit more. Um, Lauren, what do you think? Um, how can we make secondhand easier for people? Uh, is re repair always going to be a niche thing or is it possible to mainstream that? If so, how would we go about doing it? What do you think? Yeah, I think um, in terms of making it easier for people, I think that's really important because, you know, we have to be so aware in all of these conversations of various levels of privilege and having the time to either take something to a dry cleaners and have it repaired or learn the skills, look up a YouTube tutorial, buy the needles and thread, do it yourself. You know, not everybody is going to be able to do that. If you've got three young children who are tearing through clothes at a pace, you're not always going to have you know, the, the time to do that. And I think that making it, yeah, making it as easy as possible for a new generation as well is really important. So I've been really encouraged by um, the rise of repair apps that we're starting to see now. So there's one um, in the UK called Sojo, which has been getting a lot of press this week. And I'm really encouraged by that. And it's essentially Deliveroo for repair. You know, I think you sign up to the job that you need and um, somebody comes and picks it up, takes it away, fixes it and brings it back. I think we're going to see more of that. I think um, something that I really hope we're going to see more of, and I think Selfridges does do this, is um, repairs in store. You know, I think that we want to see brands taking responsibility for their clothes at every stage of life. So it's not just about selling them and then that's it. They've washed their hands of that garment. It's actually being invested in that story right the way through. So, you know, we should be able to take something back to the shop that we bought it from and um, have it repaired, maybe for free. Maybe we pay a small amount, but... You know, I think that in the future, hopefully we'll see people actually factoring that in almost to their shopping budget. The idea that you might buy something and think, well, in, you know, three years time, I'm going to need to have that re, you know, the leather restitched or maybe I have the lining changed or things like that. Um, yeah, I think that it's all about creating, you know, as Shawnee said, those stories and actually taking away that stigma of, you um, clothes that are visibly repaired kind of being almost a signifier of, of poverty and something that people were ashamed of in previous generations. And I think we can't blame people potentially for stepping away from that because for maybe my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, it was something to be ashamed of. And so it's inevitable that, you know, it's taken us a long time to almost get back to a point where we can be proud and wear visible mending and darning and things like that as a, a sort of badge of honour. But I think we are getting there, definitely. Um, and the same with second hand, you know, I think it's been really interesting just seeing people kind of, uh, yeah, engage with buying some more premium items um, second hand and not feeling that there is any kind of stigma. And technology is definitely helping with that. I think, you know, we've got brilliant apps for sort of filtering the whole of the internet and finding what we're looking for. And then also some really great sellers that are specialising in curating uh, drops of vintage clothing that really fit a certain aesthetic. So it's not just a big dusty jumbly muddle of clothes that you have to sift through. Right. It's actually, you know, the work is done for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then Aisha, like, are you seeing more people thinking of themselves as creators instead of consumers? And um, what do you think is the, I guess, sort of the key to, to getting people to engage in that shift in mindset? Hmm. I mean, I think definitely with um, with social media and this new way of sharing your creations and sharing um, tools and techniques, um, especially even like, you know, the five minute crafts and the DIY instructables, um, people 
Uh, and I think it's really important that Lauren said about time and accessibility in terms of people might not have the time to do this, but um, it's also if you do have the time or if there's the time we say you're a person who scrolls and I've done it um, for hours on a website uh, to shop, that time could may have been better spent maybe you know darning or learning to darn um so it's just kind of like that slight reframe of perspective which would be really cool and yeah i've seen um like so many amazing young creatives um share their wares online and i think that's really amazing and like also the hopefully like with this increased sharing it allows people who haven't necessarily gone through um an education system because i went to an art school and the art school was um Central St. Martin's which is a fashion school um it makes you think like oh I can't do fashion because these people on this prestigious course they're the fashion designers but actually we can all so um like we all have the capacity to do that and um if we want to invest the time in that um I think it's really important yeah so you, yeah, so we've mentioned privilege a couple times, and then you know, Lauren, you mentioned earlier that sustainability is often separated out from the conversation about humans. Um, and also, I think that fashion is just now figuring out how to combine the conversation that we're having about racial justice with sustainability. So, Aisha, I wanted to hear from you. Um, you know, how does this conversation that that the industry is having about diversity and racial justice, how is it connected back to sustainability in, in your mind? Well, I think there's, in the fashion industry, you have, there's so many layers. There's the advertisements, and that's where we show, that's where a lot of the diversity is shown. It's when you uh, diversify your modeling cast. Um, and there's that is, forward rate forward facing and it is performative because it's um although those models are getting money those models are getting the support um that's not the the whole story of that garment um or that collection because obviously that garment has passed through so many other industrial processes which have included um people from the global south most likely and so those people need to be included in that conversation if we're going to talk about diversity in fashion and um, yeah, so sometimes when I see uh, brands that uh, are like showing diversity, I don't want to say performing diversity, but um, it is, I do feel like um, if you're gonna use a face of color, then um, also you must be accountable for all of the, the hands that, that that garment has gone through. Um, so there's loads of work to do. Like Lauren said, transparency is so key. It would be amazing to see an advert for a collection uh, where all the people who made the collection were in the advert modeling those clothes or just like i don't know like just the story of that that piece of clothing that for me is like a really cool advert because you're like oh it's gone from there and there and then it went through this water treatment plant and all this and then you've got the garment that's the story not the um the model at the end of it yeah, there's so much to dig into there. And and Lauren, for you, you know, like, um, how do we connect these conversations that we're having about accessibility back to sustainability? What are what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I think that um, it's just so important to take a really intersectional approach. You know, we are far beyond being able to talk about these issues separately. And I think as soon as you understand that, um, you know, 80 percent of garment workers around the world are young women and you know they are overwhelmingly young women of color so at, you know one end of the supply chain you've got people of color being exploited and then at the other end of the supply chain one thing we're starting to understand a lot more about now is and you know the reason that resale is so important to focus on is that actually that waste that huge you know waste that we are generating through fast fashion habits is now being exported overseas to countries like um, Ghana and Kenya, particularly in other African nations, where so many of our cast offs are actually really stifling local textile economies and creating huge problems with pollution over there and still ending up most of them in landfill. And that is something that I think, you know, consumers in the UK are not particularly aware of, you know, we're only starting to wake up to that. And you can't separate that out from racism and colonialism. You just, you know, we can't, we have to accept that the fashion industry that we know has been built on the back of colonialism. Um, 
I also think that in terms of accessibility, something that I end up having a lot of conversations around with second hand is size inclusivity and uh, the mm -hmm. sustainable fashion movement generally still has a really long way to go before it is catering fairly and openly to everybody. Um, you know, traditionally sustainable fashion brands have taken their lead from mainstream fashion brands and, you know, they all start their collections at a size six or a size eight. Um, and it's, you know, incredibly frustrating for, for larger shoppers who, you know, feel that they are completely shut out of the sustainability conversation. So that is something that, you know, we have to try and address. Um, always remember that it's not a silver bullet solution for everybody so you know while I love second hand and I love to champion it and I think it's a really tricky balance because I never want anybody plus size to feel that they are left out of that conversation and that second hand is just not for them because that isn't the case either you know there is stuff out there and it is getting thankfully due to social media it's getting easier to to find larger sizes but it would be, be kind of gaslighting to pretend that it's as easy to go out and buy resale or you know pre-loved clothes if you're a size 20 than if you're a size eight so i think it's just being very aware of that and knowing that you know we have a lot of work to do in all of those areas um and yeah to remember to acknowledge that and shawnee do you see do you see sustainable fashion doing some some good work moving kind of moving away from this more privileged exclusive space that it was kind of trapped in in its earlier incarnations um, I want to say, I, what I would love to say is yes, I think we have right. some way to go. Um, and I'm, I think we're just starting to see a change. And certainly, um, I think we're probably all from the generation of uh, the unpaid internship, which was a really, really surefire way of making sure that now the people in leadership are mostly white. And, you know, certainly um, as a white woman, I feel complicit in that, um, be, you know, so I think that there are a lot, there's a lot that leaders in fashion can still do to section some of their time and some of their budget um, to sort of um, readdressing that imbalance. So I want to make sure we get to the audience Q&As. We have about um, 15 minutes left. Um, so our first question is for you, Aisha, and it is, you are an inspiration uh, to Ruby. And uh, she says, how do you think the addiction to the idea of the eternal youth fountain affects our nonstop consumerism? That's super interesting. Mm, that is a beautiful question, the eternal youth fountain. Um, that is like this sort of mythological um, idea that uh, we, uh, like have this fountain of youth that we can drink from and be young forever and I think um, I at least as now I'm in my late 20s I'm really um, enjoying the kind of um, I know that's still quite young but um, I feel old and I'm embracing that as like um, each year I'm, I'm getting wiser and um, uh, I, I feel like changing the perspective of, of like when you're young is the only time you can enjoy and that you're in your prime when you're younger actually we get better with age like fine wine um so um investing in things that will last us um will it is that is a way of divesting also from consumer the consumer rat race because we're not constantly then having to buy these exciting colorful um and cheap things that will break easily, um, that will just yeah like feed us in that moment. But actually, investing in something that really is going to last and that you can see will be timeless. Um, but yeah, um, but I do feel like um, the idea of eternal youth um, is nourished by um, investing um, time and money in things that really um feed yourself and feed the, your world around uh, the world around you um like if you're buying cheap things buying fast fashion that's not healthy and that's not um gonna uh there's not it's not it's not the fountain of youth basically but yeah um definitely want to think about it. and thank you ruby for your question and uh yeah you hear the music there's a lot to there 
Yeah. So the, the next question is sort of connected and it's for Shawnee. Um, Patrick says, you know, you spoke about that a lot of this is about a change in mindsets, uh, making people think about the environmental and human impact of their clothes as opposed to just cost, functionality, style. So the question is, do you think that a lack of knowledge is the only obstacle that needs to be overcome or could a general lack of compassion uh, for the environment and garment workers be at play too? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it, it comes back to that gap between our, our values and our actions, because I think that actually the most people you would speak to would agree, would, would really hold compassion and empathy for garment workers and concern about the future of our environment. Um, it's the fact that that value is not then transferred into action and what's breaking there that I think is is the big thing. Um, I think you're right that, that education and knowledge probably isn't the only thing. Um, and certainly if you look at studies in terms of behavior change, uh, knowledge, it, it, sort of education and knowledge isn't perhaps the best way of changing behavior in the long term. And actually, if you want to change behavior in the long term, there are some really interesting other routes that you can get there to, such as just completely changing the context of shopping, shopping in a brand new way. And in that new context, you might do something a little bit more sort of empathetically driven. Um, yeah, so I think that maybe we are sort of going to knowledge and sort of um, uh, education as our easy sort of behavior change tactics and there are more creative ways that we can change behavior. That's super interesting. So the next question, um, and I was hoping that someone would ask, and this is for Lauren and Shawnee, you both gave up on fast fashion for a period of time. Did you have any withdrawal or symptoms or side effects from doing that? <laughs> Lauren, do you want to go first? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, it took me, I think, about three months to uh, not automatically kind of go to go on ASOS every time I picked up my phone, um, even sort of stopping my feet automatically walking into shops when I was going past them on the high street. Yeah, I, I did. I felt um, almost embarrassed to be out in public wearing clothes that didn't feel entirely on trend. And that is a ridiculous thing to admit. But one of the first things that I realized when I, I made that change was just how intrinsically my own self-worth was tied to what I wore. And not in a positive way either, like it was very much, I felt like I had to be constantly bang up to date um, in a way that I'm always a bit embarrassed now to look back and admit. So it was a struggle, but actually it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be. And I would say that by the time I was about six months into that year, my kind of, my habits had changed. I had gone through the slightly painful admin process, which I recommend everybody does if they want to quit fast fashion, which is unsubscribing from all of the marketing emails, unfollowing all of the influencers and all of the brands on social media that kind of drive you to shop. Um, and I felt so much calmer around clothes. And the upshot of it is that I actually feel a lot more creative now in what I wear. I am much more closely aligned, I would say, with my own personal style. You know, I, I know what I love because I love it. Whereas before, I think I was never quite sure if I was buying things because I loved them or because um, society or, you know, the media or whoever was telling me that I ought to be wearing them. And so that is definitely one really positive thing that has come out of it is, you know, I'm so much more comfortable letting trends pass me by. Um, I don't feel the need to sort of jump in every bandwagon. And, you know, I think I'm much better at making a call based on whether I love something, whether it suits me, whether it's something that I really want in my life for years and years to come. Um, but it, it was a rocky road. And honestly, even after a year, those impulses, they're still there. They're still kind of embedded in my brain. And I think um, from a psychological perspective, like realizing that shopping is not the only way to celebrate something happy happening in my life, to medicate when I'm sad or I've got PMS or I'm hungover, you know, it was always my go-to. And so having to actually find other coping mechanisms um, has been definitely a part of the process. And I think I'm still, I'm still learning. And Shawnee, for you, did you have any withdrawal symptoms and were, were you able to use your, your own knowledge of psychology to, to overcome them? <laughs> I, first of all, Lauren, I feel so seen right now. I've never felt so seen. <laughs> and actually, um, the, when I was in the first three months, which I agree is the, is the withdrawal <laughs> time frame, 
it felt the, the closest thing I could relate it to was a breakup, um, a romantic breakup, uh, which is why when I, when your book came out, I was like, yes, <laughs> uh, this is exactly how it feels. Um, what helped me was having a, a essentially a sort of set of sponsors like friends that I could turn to whenever I you know whenever there was a sample sale and it was making me feel sick that I couldn't go um and yeah even now uh even after a year even though the the general the, there were so many gains but the, I guess the sort of biggest gain was the feeling of just freedom like unshackled freedom um, going into Westfield and having nothing to do in there and no tensions or ties or pulls just free uh, was such an amazing feeling and something that I would encourage everyone to try. Um, but yes, uh, the, 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 um, the triggers are still there. Um, and so the sponsors are also still there. <laughs> so we have another question and it's for Aisha and um, Melanie asks that, you know, you mentioned education, um, you know, knowing how to sew and to mend garments. Aside from teaching practical skills, do you think the education system could also do more to simply create awareness of uh, the fashion industry's environmental impact. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, okay, so let's start, let's start from the top. Was, yeah. My answer was yes, definitely. Schools um, and education systems can definitely do more to teach, um, to, uh, to teach and to learn um, more. Because I feel like maybe even um, the teachers uh, might not be learning that. So um, there's it's a holistic way of of thinking about fashion. And um, with everything, if we teach it to our students, they're the next generation. They're the generation that are going to actually fight for um, better. Um, better pay of garment workers, uh, better treatment of garment workers. Uh, we're trying to do that now, but we have to keep instilling that in our youth. Otherwise, these big industries and these big fashion houses aren't going to listen and they're going to keep um, doing what's easy for them for profit. So yes, uh, we need to teach the kids, <laughs> definitely. So we have just a few minutes left and um, ask you all, you know, I think that in a, in to a certain degree, the pendulum is swung in the other direction, and some people actually feel guilty for buying fast fashion. So they're almost weighed down um, by the guilt of their decision. So I want to make sure um, we leave people with something that they feel really motivated to go out and do. So I want to give all of you the chance to to give the audience your you know your tip about where they should start if they want to take on sustainable fashion like what what do you think should be the first their kind of first step and uh lauren i'll i'll start with you okay so the first step that i always recommend to people is start with what is in your wardrobe first that doesn't mean swearing off shopping obviously you know we want people to go out and invest in brilliant new sustainable brands and in resale and all of that good stuff but the most sustainable garment is the one already in your wardrobe. And so I always encourage people to have a dressing up session. Like do it like we used to do when we were 15, put a soundtrack on, get some wine out and actually try on kind of new combinations of things. We've lost the art of styling essentially because we've got so used to being able to refresh our wardrobe so quickly. So, you know, have a dressing up session, really fall back in love with the clothes you already own, put together new combinations that you maybe would feel a bit embarrassed to wear outside and get more comfortable with stuff you have, find things that you know you could repair, things that you could upcycle, things that you could maybe pass on to a friend. And once you've done that, you'll have a much better idea of what you want in your wardrobe and what you have the space for and what you're ready to commit to. Um, and you know, whenever you're feeling a bit bored or like, you know, as I was saying, like you want to sort of almost medicate yourself with a shopping trip, head back to your own wardrobe instead and really get things out and remember why you bought them and why you love them in the first place. I love that. And Aisha, what about you? What's what's your your tip for people who feel overwhelmed getting into this to sustainable fashion? Where should they start? Um, I love what Lauren said. I love a dress up session. Um, and then from that, what sprung to mind was, I mean, obviously now with the restrictions easing a little bit, but this might not be available for everyone. But what I've loved to done to have done in the past is um, is a clothes swap with your friends. Maybe just choose like two, three friends you can do it at a social distance maybe in someone's back garden and all bring the clothes that you love but maybe don't fit anymore um 
and um or you're just grown tired of and just do a clothes swap and just um share garments and i feel that's it's a really beautiful way to um explore and you can also do a dress obsession while you're there um but also um i remember one of my friends that i had like this moment of epiphany where i had like uh, um like a hole in my pocket and then i had also like odd socks so i couldn't find the other sock to match this pair um and my friend was like just you just sew that sock into your pocket and then you've got a brand new pocket so you can reuse your odd socks and get a brand new pocket so that's why my tip of the day and shawnee what about you socks socks as pockets or I love the sock pocket. I've never yeah. heard that one before. <laughs> um, I guess I guess my uh, tip would be in moments of temptation uh, to really tap in and listen to the inner dialogue and all of the different tensions at play. Um, and if you do feel any guilt, just let it dissolve because guilt never makes anything better. Guilt doesn't solve anything and you have nothing to feel guilty for. You didn't design the system. So you are you are not the guilty party. Um, in terms of all of those tensions, I find that one another way of sort of quietening all of those voices is to just ask the one question, which is, did you need this before you saw it? <laughs> did you need it before you saw it? Um, and just have that as a little mantra as you're going through as you're shopping, as you're scrolling, um, because quite often we can convince ourselves that we need things that perhaps we didn't before we knew they existed. I love that. That's such a, a great place to stop. So thank you uh, to all of our panelists, Lauren, Aisha, and Shawnee. You're all brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your insights to our audience. Thank you for tuning in and uh, you know listening to our panelists and for your really thought-provoking questions. They were fantastic. And of course, finally, thank you to Selfridges and Intelligence Squared for bringing us all together today. So I hope wherever you are, uh, whatever time zone you're in, enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. And thank you so much. And happy Earth Day and Earth Week. <laughs>